All right, so we're going live in a couple of seconds. Hi, everyone. Welcome. We're just going to wait a couple of minutes to begin. Welcome. Hi everyone, welcome. Okay, so we're going to begin. Firstly, welcome everyone to the Feminist Leadership in Disarmament webinar. A welcome, of course, to our five incredible speakers who we will officially introduce later on. Christine Ann, one of our panelists, is unable to join us now in real time due to unfavorable time differences, but we have her contribution pre recorded. This webinar is very important to us all at Scrap, the, for many reasons, the first of which it's the opening webinar to our broader feminist disarmament project, which in addition to a webinar series, we have been conducting research, writing blog posts and opinion pieces, and also launching a, um, a mass social media campaign. The project's objectives are to raise awareness of women from the global south, um, in, in particular, but not exclusively, and their achievements and contributions to the field, as well as exploring the challenges facing women from entering and progressing in the field, and what steps can be uh, taken to overcome these challenges. And finally, what is the role of women and feminist perspectives for disarmament? Why is this important? As the opening webinar, we hope to have a diverse and broad discussion touching on these themes, which we also hope gives a taster to what the more focused sub webinars in our webinar series have to offer and will focus on. In general terms, then we hope that our project can contribute to the global movement and momentum, which is working towards enhancing female representation and participation in disarmament, peace building, and security discourses and policy. Just briefly, um, a quick introduction to SCRAP. We, uh, SCRAP Weapons, we are a campaign that suggests adopting legal international agreements as a basis for general and complete global disarmament. At SCRAP, we are constantly developing research projects about disarmament, verification, emergent technologies, and of course, feminism in the field. And we hope to mobilize governmental, non-governmental, economic and expert forces in support of the same outcome. Very briefly, my name is Nancy and I'm a research assistant at Scrap Weapons along with my colleague Yanis. And together we will be moderating this webinar. Yanis and I are part of a team of 13 SCRAP members on the Feminist Disarmament Project. And together we have been working for over six months now on the research, the organization and the deliberation of this project. Thank you, Nancy. Um, the 
gender balance in disarmament forums is disturbing and problematic. Uh, according to UNIDIA study, in small forums, only around 20% are women. In larger forums, the proportion stands around 32%. But there is improvement. The Disarmament and International Security Committee of the UN consisted of women for less than 10% in the 1980s, with 32% today. Taking a look at the other topic committees shows that disarmament has a particular problem. It is the least balanced committee of all six committees in the United Nations. This suggests that there is more to the issue than numbers, that it's a systemic problem. Today in the upcoming 14 weeks, panelists will talk about representation, about systemic issues and how they promote feminist leadership in disarmament through grassroots activism as well as diplomacy. They will also talk about a new legal instrument, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which aims to support these efforts. This series will consist of seven webinars in total, and we invite you to join us every second Wednesday at 2 p.m. Um, English time from today until May. The format of this webinar will be as follows. Each of the speakers will give a brief presentation, and afterwards we will have time for Q&A. So please put your questions in the Q&A uh, function during the webinar. When you ask a question, please include as well um, who of the panelists that is directed at. Great, so without further ado, I shall introduce our first speaker for today, which is uh, Rebecca Johnson. Dr. Rebecca Johnson is an eco-feminist peace activist and organizer from Greenham Common to ICANN and XR Peace. Her 35 years of publications span women's nonviolent opposition to patriarchal violence, nuclear colonialism, humanitarian disarmament and diplomacy, including NPT meetings, um, INF treaty verification, the nuclear ban process and the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. The topic of Rebecca's presentation today is feminist transformations and women's participation power, diplomacy, and activism for security, peace, and disarmament. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I hope you can see the screen share. Is that working? Can you see my first slide on? Okay, excellent. So I'd like to thank SOAS and also the Scrap uh, Feminist Project uh, and all of you for, invite, for set, setting up this project and inviting me uh, to take part. <clears throat> So, well, true to feminist principles, my presentation is going to interweave the personal and the political and show also a number of photographs because, as we all know, uh, the, you know, the visual, the photos uh, can show things more quickly and directly often than a whole load of, of words. So I'll just start with a little bit of my story because I think it connects in, in what we need to think about because every single one of us has the power to change the future. And that's very much the meaning of that green and web. You can see that poster in the, in the corner of the barbed wire of the US Air Force Base, this was depicting, with a, a spider's web. And you can just make out caught in that spider's web is a nuclear armed cruise missile. And this poster comes from 1982, when I was first living at the camp, when a group of us, not very many of us at that time, we'd been evicted, it was very nasty weather, it rained for 40 biblical days. But we organized this action on December the 12th and 13th, uh, embrace the base and close the base. And this was when I first really came to understand that me alone, I, you know, I'm not very important. I'm very ordinary. I, you know, I had been, actually, I was a student at SOAS at the time. <laughs> um, but uh, as I became involved, and I think we need to remember back to the 80s where really 
we lived under the cloud, under the shadow, under the Damocles sword of nuclear war. It was very real and immediate to us in the way that climate destruction is very real and immediate to the, the particularly the young people like Greta Thunberg and all those young people that came out with her in solidarity, but in on their own, re, for their own reasons and their own uh, fears, but also their own recognition they had to act to stop climate destruction. They had to act for the future. They went on, on school strike. They came out of the, uh, you know, colleges. They came out into the streets. There was Extinction Rebellion out in the streets here in London. This was how it was for us in the 80s on nuclear weapons, particularly at the early part. So <clears throat> our experiences growing up as girls in sexist, racist societies also let us not forget the disadvantage that, you know, the class analysis that recognizes the, the disadvantage of poverty, of, of, of diminished access to education that some girls, many girls throughout the world uh, experience. Um, you know, all of these, they, they have, it's a mix of positive and negative, how we, how we grew up, our families, our social situation. But both kinds have provided each of us with the concerns, the reasons, the insights, the ideas, the drivers that impel and equip us to work for disarmament, peace and feminist security, by which I mean real, human, environmental, humanitarian, personal and political security. And so that's really my starting point. And for me, that journey started actually when I was living in Alaska at the age of 18 and I was, was uh, you know, uh, cleaning houses and looking after other people's children. And I became inspired by environmental activists trying to stop an oil pipeline. I loved Alaska. I, you know, I was there for about nine months. And, um, <clears throat> and I, you know, raised, you know, I, I earned extra money singing in cafes and realized that all my songs were about about pollution and about the destruction of the earth. But my songs during that nine months in Alaska also started to be much more about women and the power of women and sisterhood and doomed love. <laughs> so violence against the planet and also violence against women were very much drivers. And then of course, as I mentioned, SOAS was another part of my, um, my journey. And so, you know, at Greenham where I lived for uh, 90, uh, from 1982 until we got the INF Treaty. Yes, it changed my life. And that's why I've, I, I was invited to, to choose my own subject. And I looked at feminist transformations and women's participation, power, diplomacy and action. And that's really what I want to focus on. So from protests to treaties, I didn't really know about, I was originally trained as a physicist, but I was at SOAS um, studying um, uh, China, Japan, Korea, and the US-Soviet rivalry and pressures in the Far East. That was the subject I did my master's on. And then I started a PhD on women's political participation in Japan. But by that time, I was already at Greenham. Um, and by um, after my second stint in Holloway Prison, I was called by SOAS. I had, you know, I was hardly there. And, I kindly but very firmly told I had to choose between Greenham and my PhD. And, you know, like the climate activists, I didn't actually feel I had a choice. I, I felt that we had to do everything to stop nuclear war. And so I, I chose Greenham. But actually, it was a choice. So my first point here really is be true to yourself. I could only be an activist at that time because I didn't have the expertise or the education or nobody would have listened to me. I didn't have any of those things. But as an activist, I connected up with so many other women and the direct 
aspects of what we did. And you can see in these pictures, you know, blockading uh, that that's a US Air Force bus and then going into the nuclear weapon silos on New Year's Day of 83. And we ended up dancing at the top of them. That was the iconic picture. And then when they did bring the nuclear convoy, uh, the nuclear weapons in and start take them, taking them out on the roads, there we were together with local people as crews watch. There were we green and women and local people. And we were both leaders and organizers and, and followers. And that's something else I want to stress is that women have kind of different ways of doing things. This is not biological, this is structural and societal, if you like, but our experiences have been that different. And at Greenham, I really learned the power, the difference between power over as enjoyed and practiced and perpetuated if they were able to get away with it by patriarchal leaders and the power of the power we can grow within ourselves to make the changes that are needed and that will seek to and that help us amp amplify our power of change, our power to do. And here I just wanted to show, you know, there's, there's Ellen in front of the Fazlay nuclear base, there's Setsuko speaking in, um, uh, sorry, I've yeah, there's Setsuko speaking in, um, sorry, I seem to have, yeah, Setsuko speaking in the UN during the negotiations on the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. There are the young people uh, who are part of the Amplify uh, youth group of ICANN uh, from Australia, from Iran, at one of the meetings that led to that. And I know uh, Ray is going to talk much more about that. But it's this collectivity of the power of one multiplied. And I also and have uh, the picture in the corner, um, which I hope you can see clearly enough, um, of um, 2018, um, the Women Cross DMZ, and you can see a number of activists, um, and I think uh, Christine Arn is, is in the bit that's covered by my, um, uh, I can't see it very clearly on my, uh, very clearly on my screen. So these are some of the issues. So the next thing is to ask questions, and then get involved. And don't be afraid, be true to yourself and recognize that it's all different kinds of involvement. So I want to move a little bit more quickly. The greatest threat to our planet is the belief that someone else will save it. That again is such a powerful motivation for women. So if you take an, an action like I did, where I actually decided I was just going to live outside a nuclear base until we got rid of the, of the nuclear weapons, which we did, as part of a great movement. Um, but I didn't actually lose out. I keep being asked about sacrifice. It was a choice, but I still had my science training. I still turned that into a way to be a diplomat, an activist, a citizen's diplomat, if you like. So women's participation is in it enhances creativity it gives it shows different ways of looking at the problems and therefore different ways to find the solutions it's more sustainable there's there's lots of studies now about more sustainable security disarmament more sustainable agreements across diplomacy if women are involved and i was very influenced by audre lords 1979 essay, The Master's Tools Will Never Dismantle the Master's House. She also said, our silence will not protect us. So those are the motivating things. But our silence can be represented in a number of different kinds of ways, or rather our, our refusal to be silent can be reflected in a number of different ways. And here again, these are just examples. Uh, on the, the, the top, that's actually an all women panel in the Conference on Disarmament Chamber talking about 
um, the science behind the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, or it might have actually been a space security uh, panel. I'm, I'm, I'm on that. And it, it, it was both accidental and intentional that women should, um, should be on that panel. Women were actually experts in those issues, but often overlooked. And so I want to pay tribute to, to women like Patricia Lewis, and, and you see her there at one of the humanitarian impacts of nuclear um, weapons conferences that led to the, the, the recent treaty. But there she is presenting, but she was UNIDIR's um, director for 10 years from 1997. And in her time, she really brought in women, very, very practical feminist action to make it possible for far more women to get onto panels, to speak, to learn, to, to, to be part of diplomacy. That pressure then filtered through so far more women than when I first was at the uh, in Geneva as a campaigner for the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. And that there was only a handful of, of, of ambassadors who were women to now when it's far more. Then also the role in, viol um, in, in verification and disarmament uh, implementation. And this was a, a CTBTO um, uh, uh, on-site inspections, uh, 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 what was called exercise in Kazakhstan that lasted actually a month and I was very privileged to be able to join it um, and be part of it and then uh, and women are increasingly coming into those areas as experts and being trained up so my so I also want to talk about uh, the ways in which if, if we see ourselves as working together then we see ourselves as you know this was the web of Greenham where we connect up and we support each other. And then of course, the other, uh, other one is the picture of Ambassador Elaine White Gomez sharing the, as president of the conference. Here, just to remind us, nonviolent power, feminist nonviolent power is very, very active. We have nothing to do with the passive resistance, but it is not about violent aggression, just as we recognize that conflict is essential for change, but violence is not essential for start resolving conflicts. And this again is where women's perspectives come into these conflicts and start to work on them in ways that involve far more people, far more women, far more younger people, far more diverse people and um, to make the changes. That's what we did at Greenham. And of course, that picture of Gorbachev and Reagan signing the INF Treaty in 1987 was all about men. It, it was in those days. It still is to a large ex extent when we think of the obstacles, misogyny and an underestimation of, you know, the skills, the resources, the the ideas, the creativity, the effectiveness of women. These are obstacles we have to overcome and we can only overcome collectively, but we can do this one by one and, and together, and we have to keep working. And that the middle picture is the, um, the picture of that nuclear weapon silo at Greenham Common that we danced on. I took that picture in 2000. The weapons had gone, the Americans had got, the, the, you know, the US Air Force had gone. The silo had to stay so that the Soviets, now Russians of course, could inspect. Sadly, Putin and Trump in a patriarchal alliance have, 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 have destroyed that treaty. But for the sake of the of the world, we need to be nonviolent activists who are analytical activists and activist analyzers. We have it is vital for raising public awareness on many dimensions through parliamentarians, uh, not just symbolic, but also um, through communication, education, and it is sometimes disruptive but it creates transformation and that is what we need to do in order 
to prevent nuclear war, to prevent or, or to tackle climate destruction. And as we see, to tackle COVID and these pandemics, look who are the leaders that are doing that best. I think I must have used I'm up my 10 sorry. minutes. <laughs> I'm sorry. sorry to interrupt you. Um, oh, sorry, I, I over, but... <laughs> didn't see anything because it was I had my screen. Let me stop sharing now. No problem. Thank you so much. It's it's amazing to hear you know your your experiences and your activism, and it's incredibly inspiring. So thank you so much for that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the insights, Rebecca. That was really really interesting. Um, next speaker is Ray Atchison. Ray Atchison is the director of Reaching Critical Will, the disarmament program of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, as well as a steering group representative of the international campaign. To abolish nuclear weapons, I can, and the campaign to stop killer robots. Ray is the author of the book Banning the Bomb, Smashing the Patriarchy, which will be released in June 2021. I did pre order it already, um, and she's going to talk about the importance of enhancing feminist perspectives, the negotiations of the TPNW, and uh, why a feminist process produced a feminist treaty. Thank you very much, Yanis, and thanks to Scrap for organizing this important webinar series. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing all of the different segments. Um, so building off of what Rebecca has said about the importance of diversity in participation, I really want to talk about why that is so important and in terms of the perspectives that it brings into the spaces that have been dominated for so long by a certain segment of the world's population, which has overwhelmingly been Western, white, straight men. Um, and so that's not to say that um, men that fit into that category can't be um, feminists themselves, because of course they can. And that's one of the things that I want to put forward is that when I'm talking about gender, when I'm talking about um, when I'm talking about men or women, I want to give a caveat that I'm not talking about absolutes. I'm talking about the way that we are socialized within all of our societies around the world in terms of how we're expected to behave, how we're expected to think, and how we're expected to relate to each other and the world based on these categories that we're put in. And so I'm a category smasher. I don't like binaries. Um, I don't like to fulfill expectations of how we're supposed to be in this world. Um, and so I invite all of you to come along on that journey and smash some categories with me. Um, and so that's why I'm talking about perspectives more than who is participating. And I wanna talk about bringing feminist perspectives into um, the spaces that we operate in. And I really mean an intersectional feminist perspective. So post-colonial and anti-racist um, and anti-ableist um, and uh, a, a non-violent type of, of feminism an anti-militarist, anti-war kind of feminism. Wilp has been doing this work since 1915. So I'm building off of a very long legacy of more than a century of work of feminists um, critiquing militarism from this perspective. Um, and really it brings a lot of crucial things to our conversations about weapons and war in particular. It helps us to understand how people can be differentially or disproportionately impacted by specific weapons or by conflict and violence. And there's a lot of work that's gone on around that, but it also gives us key insights about gender norms that I was just talking about that are really imperative, in my opinion, to understanding weapons proliferation and possession and use um, and to understand why our world is so militarized the way it is. So, for example, if we look at nuclear weapons, um, I really think of them as the leading edge of the patriarchal militarist mindset of this idea that might makes right and the best way to be secure is to be able to commit massive genocidal violence and that weapons are the only way to to make your country um, or your government um, safe and secure but nuclear weapons don't keep us safe they've only ever caused harm but this is completely discounted by the policy establishment elite because it's not harm to them they profit from nuclear weapons. Um, 
it both politically um, and militarily, but also financially. Um, but they don't experience the effects of uranium mining or the fallout from nuclear weapon testing or from radioactive waste. Um, all of those harms are borne by communities around the world that are largely indigenous, poor, um, and folks of color. And that is where the differential impacts come in, but it's also where the sort of um, policy elite versus actual lived reality and lived experience um, are at tension with each other. And this is why the policy elite is able to treat deterrence as if it's the gospel truth of nuclear weapons. Um, and, you know, in universities, in um, the corridors of power, we're not allowed to critique deterrence. That would be considered uncredible and unrealistic and naive, and we don't really understand how geopolitical security works, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but there's a lot of evidence to point out that deterrence is a myth. Um, and without getting into that debate, which is you know, largely about proving negatives, we need to look at the material reality of nuclear weapons that I was just talking about, which exclu is exclusively harm from development, testing, use, and waste. And nuclear weapons also make the world way more dangerous. We can see this just by reading the news and looking at the mounting tensions around the world. Um, and the threats that they pose to exacerbating climate change and resulting in famine and, and global catastrophe in, in many different ways. Feminist understandings help us sort through the myths and the challenges that this supposition that nuclear weapons are about security mount to us. Um, feminist understandings about power um, and about dominance are very important to wading our way through these arguments and understanding not just what makes the support for nuclear weapons problematic, but why that support has persisted for so long, despite the overwhelming evidence that nuclear weapons are, are bad for our safety, our security, and our, our human and planetary well-being. I, I believe that without this feminist analysis, it's really easy to miss how the norms around masculinity, which I was talking about earlier. So what it means to be a real man in how we're socialized, not in what it actually is to be a man or a woman or non-binary, um, but how these ideals are really based on um, the equation of violence with strength and weapons with power. And we've inherited this patriarchal system. We're, we're steeped in it, we're immersed in it. Um, and it's organized international relations and it's organized domestic budgets around the idea that strength and security can best be secured through violence. But feminism helps us unpack this for what it is and it opens space then to consider what we actually need in order to achieve peace and equality and justice and safety for the most people possible. It helps us to break through the paradigm of international relations as an exercise of violent masculinity that's on display all the time in the UN and in bilateral relations and within alliances um, and to really pursue a different path of collective security, of cooperation, of building bridges and understanding each other's positions and really working for a common ground. Um, we saw in the negotiation of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, a lot of these dynamics play out, which is why I wanted to use it as an example today. But really, you could pick a lot of different examples um, of treaty making in the UN or you know, um, NATO actions around the world and the positions of, of a lot of the major players. Um, so there's a lot to draw on. But I wanted to focus on the TPNW because I think it's such a great case study. In the resistance from the nuclear armed states and some of their nuclear supportive allies like NATO and South Korea, Japan, Australia, in this collective resistance to the prohibition of nuclear weapons, we could see a lot of gendered tactics, a lot of patriarchal tactics used to try and prevent this process from going forward. Um, so the, the, not just the activists, but also the diplomats and government officials that were promoting the humanitarian initiative and engaged in the humanitarian conferences 
um, leading up to the treaty making process, they were told that they were irrational, that they didn't have any real security interests in the world, they just didn't understand the value of nuclear weapons. And they were also told that they were being emotional, that all of this work to develop international law uh, was emotional work. Um, and I think that for many diplomats working on this of all genders and orientations, it was really kind of a key wake up moment of how um, patriarchal and gendered the, the opposition to, to banning nuclear weapons really was. Um, and the way that I try and think and, and write about the TPNW is that it was a feminist response to this pressure to not move forward, to not try to take on the most quote unquote powerful states in the world and to oppose their weapons of violence and to deconstruct their narratives. All of these are feminist things, standing up to power, deconstructing you know, dominant narratives and unpacking concepts and really problematizing things that have been long held truths in our world. Um, this was a feminist response. It was a feminist process and in the end, a feminist product as well. So in relation to process, um, the treaty negotiations were not rendered beholden to a few heavily militarized countries, which is how a lot of things work in the UN, unfortunately, um, uh, is that the most powerful heavily weaponized countries like the US and Russia and others um, have a, an outsized say in what can move forward and what can't move forward and, and what countries can do. But with them boycotting this process, it really created the space for an alternative approach to treaty making, um, giving more equitable space to all countries of the world, um, being more inclusive and transparent, um, involving activists in a real way, uh, survivors, academics, international organizations working together with states. Um, there was an emphasis on trying to promote um, diversity amongst the diplomats that were involved. So there was sponsorship funds for bringing um, young women diplomats into the negotiations and into other um, of the meetings leading up to the negotiations. And then in its provisions itself of the treaty, which I describe as our first feminist international law on nuclear weapons, the treaty recognizes the gendered impacts of nuclear weapons. It promotes women's participation in nuclear disarmament discussions and initiatives. It recognizes the impacts of nuclear weapon activities on indigenous communities, and it includes victim assistance and environmental remediation obligations in the treaty. So it's not a perfect instrument. The process wasn't perfect, and I'm not trying to say either of those two things. But I do think that in terms of the efforts that have been made um, to both have a process and product that reflected feminist principles, this is so far the closest that we've come in the world of nuclear weapons. And it gives us so much to build on in the future to move all of these agendas forward together. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Ray, so much. Um, I think you know, the TPNW is a milestone event and we needed this incredible um, news and positive news for 2021 following um, the year that everyone has had. So yeah, thank you so much for your um, input there. I move on to our third speaker, Charlene Roop Narin. Charlene is an international relations officer at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Trinidad and Tobago. Her portfolio includes issues related to disarmament, non-proliferation and arms control and women, peace and security. Charlene also remains engaged with United Nations entities and NGOs to advocate for the women, peace and security agenda. Charlene will also, was also facilitator of Resolution 6569, the only United Nations General Assembly resolution to address the issue of women disarmament, non-proliferation and arms control. This will be the topic of Charlene's presentation today. Thank you, Nancy. And I would like to thank Scrap Weapons for the invitation to participate in this very important webinar series on um, focused on women and feminist perspectives in disarmament. I speak in my capacity as facilitator of 
Resolution 6569 from 2012 to 2018. And this resolution is entitled Women, Disarmament, Non-Proliferation and Arms Control, and it's piloted by Trinidad and Tobago in the first committee of the General Assembly. As Nancy said, 6569 is the first resolution to formally address the links between women and disarmament. And it was especially timely as the international community had just celebrated in 2010, the 10th um, anniversary of Security Council Resolution 1325 which was also the first Security Council resolution that specifically addresses the impact of war on women and women's contributions to conflict resolution and sustainable peace. In fact, also the year 2020 marked a significant milestone in the life of Resolution 6569, as that was also the 10 year anniversary of um, this resolution. 6569, if I were to think back, was one of the more popular um, resolutions in the first committee, uh, one of um, the resolutions that was a, a bit more contentious because of its very nature. Because for the first time, a resolution did to explicitly address the issue of women in arms control. And this was inconsistent with the traditional tone and tenor of the first committee, which is usually dominated by men in black suits. The introduction of 6569 in 2010, to some extent, I would say, um, disturbed the committee's status quo. And the resolution did receive overwhelming support from many states, but a few were reluctant to accept or simply did not understand what place a resolution about women has in a committee that discusses weapons. A few could not conceptualize discussing the role of women in the context of disarmament and international security. But as we often hear, how could there be any meaningful progress in disarmament if half of the population is excluded? So imagine the audacity of a small island developing state, which is not a large scale importer of small arms and light weapons, which has no nuclear capabilities introducing a text on women, disarmament, non-proliferation and arms control to the first committee. This was exactly my introduction to the field of disarmament in general. A young diplomat and female with a mission to have as many states support resolution 6569, which was a direct um, vision of the first female prime minister of Trinidad and Tobago. So, she actually announced in her maiden contribution to the General Assembly in 2010 that Trinidad and Tobago would be piloting this text. So imagine the pressure, since she had a vested interest in this, young diplomat in a male-dominated committee pushing for countries to support a resolution of this kind. Facilitating 6569 remains one of the proudest achievements of my professional life. But the genesis of this journey felt a lot like the story of David and Goliath. I've encountered situations where some male colleagues did not engage directly with me in consultations on the resolution, but would instead address their issues with my male ambassador when he was in the conference room. Some did not consult with me on matters of substance, but had no problem suggesting to me that the resolution is better placed in the third committee that covered social, humanitarian and cultural issues. But we remained unmoved because in our region, CARICOM, we are gravely affected by the illicit proliferation of small arms and light weapons and its ammunition. There are soaring rates of gun violence, gun-related violence, and the pre prevalence of gun-related fatalities due to the proliferation of illegal arms and illicit drugs for which women and girls are disproportionately affected made it even more urgent for Trinidad and Tobago to push a resolution of this nature after this initial pushback on the resolution, and as the years progressed, support for the text grew and importantly, the language in the resolution was strengthened to include references to the Arms Trade Treaty, specifically the groundbreaking Article 7.4, which speaks to gender-based violence. Also, for small island developing states, um, the Sustainable Development Goals is very important so there is mention of that in um, resolution 6569. And the latest text also speaks to the coronavirus pandemic and progress made in gender equality. 
Um, and as I wrap up, it would be remiss if I did not recognize the very important role played by civil society in advocating for this resolution over the years. Um, I always remember drafting um, text for the 2012 version with Faladi um, at the permanent mission, um, perhaps close to midnight um, on some nights. And Ray has been involved. Um, she's been actually someone I looked up to since the very start, since the inception of this process. So I would really like to thank them and so many other persons and organizations for supporting 6569 over the years. And with that, I want to thank you again for this opportunity to share my experience. Thank you. Thank you, Celine. Really important resolution and thank you for your contribution as well. And um, thank you also for the shout out to civil society. And um, would like to give that back to um, the mission of Trinidad to the United Nations. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Christine Ahn. Christine Ahn is the founder of Women's Cross of the Korean Demilitarized Zone, a global movement of women mobilizing to end the Korean War. Her op-ads have been the New York Times, Washington Post, and Time Magazine. And she has appeared on CNN, MSNBC, and the NBC Today Show. She is the recipient of the 2020 US Peace Prize. She's going to speak about women in the Korean War, as well as her work in strengthening feminist perspectives in Korea. Due to the time difference, Christina is not able to present, but we have a video. Um, if there are any questions, please do still write them in the chat um, in the, in the Q&A function. Um, as Christine has kindly agreed to answer the questions which will be included in our report, which is following the webinar. And um, I would now let a colleague guess to put up the video. Perfect. Hi, thank you so much for having me today at this important gathering. I want to first thank the organizers and also my fellow panelists, Rebecca Johnson and Ray Atchison, who have been on this journey with us to end the Korean War. I thought I would make the best use of my time by first um, sharing with you the work of our transnational feminist campaign, um, some of the tactics and strategies that we've used, and um, use my remaining few minutes to um, just share some of my perspectives on doing this work and I'm setting the timer now so that I don't um, go far too over. So let me first start by sharing a little PowerPoint presentation uh, that I've put together and um, tell you, take you on this journey together. So um, many of you may not know this, but the Korean War, which was from 1950 to 53 ended uh, with 4 million lives claimed, mostly Koreans, innocent civilians, and it ended with a ceasefire. And that means that uh, the, the military commanders from the United States representing the UN command, which was frankly the first coalition of the willing, and the DPRK, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, North Korea, signed um, on behalf of them and there was also the Chinese Voluntary People's Army. So they um, signed the ceasefire, putting down their weapons, and they promised to return within 90 days to negotiate a permanent peace settlement. And that has not since happened. And so a state of war has defined relations between the US and North Korea for 70 years. Um, so I set up to say, well, what are we going to do about this and what I learned was that the first meeting of North and South Korean women took place in 1991 um, and that was facilitated by a Japanese member of the diet and um, so for the 70th anniversary of the Korea's division by Cold War powers the U.S. and the former Soviet Union um, I helped lead a women's peace march across the demilitarized zone from North to South Korea with 30 women peacemakers. This is the delegation and included some really uh, seasoned um, peace activists such as Lema Gaboe from Liberia and Mairead McGuire from Northern Ireland, as well as Patricia Guerrero from uh, Colombia and so many more. We held women's peace symposiums in both Pyongyang and also in Seoul, where we heard from uh, women about the impact of the unresolved 
war on their lives. And we marched. We marched with 10,000 Korean women on both sides of the demilitarized zone in, in Pyongyang. That was the previous picture. This is in Kaesong. And then we crossed the DMZ into Paju in South Korea. And then, as I noted, we held a peace symposium in Seoul as well. And, you know, frankly, why do we do this? Because we know that when women are involved in peace processes, it actually leads to a peace agreement. It leads to one that is far more durable and lasting. And we know that there are now international and national laws mandating women's inclusion. And it's not just uh, about doing this because it's law and it's the norms. And we know that the, the studies show that we should be included, but it's also the um, the, the actual peace agreements that are negotiated. We know that now that the, it actually leads to better gender provisions um, that protect women better, um, provide uh, greater participation in, in politics and in all areas of life. So that is why we continue to do this. And some of the strategies that we've used is uh, we believe that it's really critical to uh, reframe the debate and put in our feminist perspectives, um, ensure that you know we are the ones that are shaping the narrative and not just always the retired military generals or um, you know people that are part of the military industrial complex. This is what we must do as feminists. And you know, I know that many women, um, are very uncomfortable being in TV, being uh, writing op-eds, but this is what we must do. And, uh, you know, it's so important to be engaging with those who are the policymakers, those who are the ones that will um, make the decision. As we continue to advocate for our seat at the table, we must continue to be engaging. And so um, it's critical that we bring women together. So this is what we've been doing. Uh, Rebecca, there she is in a delegation that we took to Seoul as the peace process was unfolding between the two Koreas and between the US and North Korea. And so this is what we've been doing. We've been walking and talking and bringing women together. Now, given that the US is the largest obstacle to advancing a peace agreement, with North Korea, uh, we have been really trying to build the political will for peace with North Korea. And our key strategy has been engaging uh, members of Congress, um, cultivating peace champions. So Ro Khanna, who introduced the House Resolution 152, calling for an end to the Korean War with a peace agreement, now has 40 two co-sponsors, including a Republican, and um, there will be a new resolution introduced in this new Congress. And part of why we've been successful, if we compare it to a decade ago for the 60th anniversary of the Korean War, we could only get two members of Congress to support peace, much less with a peace agreement. And so now we have um, almost 50 on record supporting a peace agreement with North Korea. And part of our success is because we believe in grassroots mobilization. We, we engage uh, multi-generational, multi-racial, um, you, you know, grassroots community members. And uh, we have a seamless strategy of advocacy as well as, um, as the grassroots mobilization. And so lastly, two other things that we have produced is uh, reports. One is on the gendered human and gendered impacts of sanctions on North Korea, which um, got a lot of coverage. And then lastly, we just released this report. It's available on koreapeacenow.org. And it's, um, I would say it's the most comprehensive um, report that makes the case for a peace agreement to end the Korean War. And um, there are sections on, you know, uh, obstacles that are always presented on why we should not um, engage with peace with North Korea. So um, in my final few minutes, I believe I have, I just wanted to um, quickly, you know, share some thoughts on my experience in doing this work and why it's so crucial that we have feminist perspectives in our work towards disarmament and, and ending endless wars. And um, these are some principles that I think are really important and that um, we must infuse in our efforts in um, 
in, in bringing an, an end to all, war, all wars. So one is um, we believe it's so important to center the, the voices and the experiences that are most impacted. And so that's why when we talk about ending the Korean War, when we talk about denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, we also have to bring in the experiences of women, um, for example, that live around US military bases or the experiences of those that are being displaced, whose livelihoods, farmers, um, women sea divers, um, that live around US military bases, and also the women of North Korea who are being impacted by the sanctions. Sanctions is war by other means. And so it's really crucial as feminists that we center the voices of those that are most impacted by this unresolved war. Um, two, uh, this, I mean, I think what I shared, some of the strategies and the tactics that we use is um, perfecting democracy. And I think foreign policy has been one of those domains that have largely been um, dictated and shaped by, uh, by white men, frankly. And uh, it's so crucial that we democratize the process of US foreign policy because um, in the United States, which is the largest spender of, of uh, the military, uh, weapons of mass destruction around the world, um, more than the next 10 countries combined, um, it is crucial that we, uh, we get involved in the process. Americans, um, people from all walks of life, get involved in the process of shaping US foreign policy because not only does it impact all the people around the world where we have over 800 military bases, where we wage wars, uh, where we still have bases that are impacting um, the people in those countries, but because we won't be able to achieve the things that we want in this country, Medicare for all, um, good paying jobs, addressing climate change, um, you know, having a proper vaccination um, system in this country, um, providing vaccines for people all around the world, not just for those that are wealthy. And so I guess the final point is, um, as feminists, we have to be redefining what makes us secure. And that has been um, a really important message that we have been using in our campaign. And, um, and I think it's about reframing, you know, why we must end this war, because it is in the interest, it is about providing um, the best kind of um, security for not just Koreans, but also Americans as well. Because when we maintain this posture and stance of perennial war, um, the people don't benefit. And so peace benefits us all. And so that's why it's so crucial as feminists that we do this. And um, it has not been an easy journey. Um, I think that gender is often used, uh, obviously in my case, race, Orientalism, um, ageism. And um, I think that's why as feminists, we, we work together, we, um, we build horizontal movements together and we cross boundaries. And that's why we're so effective in doing the work that we do. Um, and so it's just, uh, I, I, I know that it's just so so compressed in such a little amount of time, but I, I, I hope you know that um, my email is always open to you and I look forward to seeing this organization continue to grow and to be a part of it in some capacity. So thank you so much for having me. Aloha. Great. Um, thanks, Christine, for, for that amazing presentation. As Christine mentioned as well, please do put questions in the chat if you want, because she has kindly said that she will answer them and we will get them put in the report afterwards. So just moving on to our last speaker, Falade Mutota. Falade is a founder and executive director of the Women's Institute for Alternative Development based in Trinidad and Tobago. Falade brings her womanist perspective to her work on security and small arms control, along with her advocacy, skills developed over a lifetime of community engagement, social policy, development research and leading change. 
Vlade will speak about how WinAd's work in challenging global governance and the global community with regards to power relations, gender, and arms producers and consumers. Thank you, Vlade. And thank you very much, Nancy. Hello to everybody and congratulations to Scrap on this project. Um, which I think is going to add to the body of knowledge on women leading change globally. So thank you for inviting WINAD as a women's organization firmly committed to advancing the rights of women and girls. Uh, I also wanna congratulate all the panelists and affirm the panelists uh, on this call today and to thank each and every one of you really for the work that you do. Thank you very much. I want to talk briefly about Winard's contribution as a women's organization to the successful Caribbean negotiations of the United Nations Arms Trade Treaty. Because I think to understand Winard's contribution to the global work on arms control, disarmament, non-proliferation and peace building requires a bit of attention to our context. Our work on gender and arms control in Trinidad and Tobago led us on an outreach to Caribbean civil society to pool our thoughts, our skills, and our resources and to work collaboratively to reduce and prevent armed violence, which is the most challenging issue <laughs> that the region has to deal with, some way, may argue. As a matter of fact, our governments refer to small arms and light weapons as the region's weapons of mass destruction. And Charlene um, gave us a snippet of the extent to which um, the proliferation and misuse of uh, illicit small arms in the region has impacted lives and economies. And so this is what brought um, Bernard into this work and which is what gave birth to CDRA, which is the Caribbean Coalition for Development and the Reduction of Armed Violence in 2000 six um, initiated by Winard and Winard continues to serve as the secretariat for CDRAV. And through the collective genius of civil society in the Caribbean and our commitment to save lives and end human suffering, we designed a path to securing the active participation of CARICOM governments in the global pursuit of an instrument to control the international trade in conventional arms. Of course, our vision for the CARICOM role in this process evolved, evolved over time into a leadership role for, for CARICOM along the way and, um, and precisely the role that CARICOM eventually played, which was a leadership role in the negotiations of the ATT. And so to talk a little bit about what CDRAV brought to the process, um, I think that we brought several, several very high valued um, things. Um, we brought across a cross-functional team because we were a coalition of NGOs from across the region, at least 10 of our 14 member states uh, were represented in the coalition at the time. And we were able to have not only a diverse geographical mix because we had um, organizations from different parts of the region, but also organizations with different um, focus, women, youth, the environment, um, farmers, labor unions, et cetera, et cetera, academics and so on. We also brought legitimacy as advocates with a history of successful interventions in the region. We brought along the trust that, that many of our governments had in the organizations that, in, that, that resided in their particular territories, but also the trust they had of us, in us as a coalition and our ability to deliver. 
I think CDRAV also brought its inclusive approach to mobilizing and managing resources, especially human resources. And of course, our pool of subject matter experts, um, along with our international network as members of Control Arms and IANSA. And of course, we all know that IANSA has been the leading uh, global organization in terms of the work around small arms and light weapons and control arms led the civil society movement that successfully got a treaty um, that controls the conventional trade in con uh, the, the, the international trade in conventional arms. But just a bit about the building blocks that we used as the to get what I consider to be a very successful campaign um, done. We first of all went about identifying a champion state within our region. Um, and that state happened to be my own country, Trinidad and Tobago. And then inside there, we identified a, a driver for that process within the state sector. And that driver that we identified actually is the unit that Charlene is located in, the treaties, legal and treaties unit of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And then we also develop um, a stakeholder management strategy for how we were going to manage the relationship with our champion state and the, 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 the institution that was going to drive the process within the context of Trinidad and Tobago's leadership. We then looked for resources, and I, I have to thank always the government of Australia, which financed the four regional workshops that, um, that we held in the region for governments and for civil society to agree on a common negotiating position going into the arms trade treaty. So we were able to mobilize resources as a civil society entity. Um, and for us, uh, as you've already heard, we needed to establish the prominence of small arms and light weapons and their ammunition in the hierarchy of considerations for the provisions of the arms trade treaty. And that was largely based really on the impact that, 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 that small arms are having on our region um, coming out of the research that we had done over time. And then we entered into a number of relationships with key regional organizations um, that were responsible for security within the region and coordinating the work of the regional bloc in the multilateral sphere. Um, and I think that we were also able to successfully maintain our relevance uh, as a partner in the process um, by providing logistical and coordination support for the team, the CARICOM team. Um, and so in order to, one of the ways that we did that really was to identify key stakeholders across the region, the subject matter experts as it were, and brought them got their governments to really um, um, uh, deploy them and, 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 and second them to the negotiating team so that we could have the capacity that we needed for the negotiations. We served on the leadership team for, for CARICOM, uh, which was responsible for all the coordination, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think we worked strategically as well with our governments, especially the government of Trinidad and Tobago to keep that team in place for three years. And for those of us who may be into human resource management, we know how difficult it is. Um, recruiting a team is all well and good, but retaining the team really is where the work is. Um, and so we, we've been very proud of our, our ability as a, as, a, as a leadership team of government and civil society to have done that. And just a little bit um, before I conclude about the composition of our, of, our, of our team going into the negotiations of the Arms Trade Treaty. The actual negotiating team had about just, about just over one third women. 
our technical people and the subject matter experts were um, about 80% men. Um, the diplomats, uh, particularly in New York, were 80% women. Um, and um, in terms of the civil society component, we were about at 80% women um, in the civil society component, as I said. So in conclusion, I would say that when I was able to demonstrate the effectiveness of women's leadership and the potential for inclusive approaches to work in the efforts at arms control, disarmament, and non-proliferation. And I think in so doing, we established the efficacy of 1325 and the Women, Peace and Security framework, as well as um, 6569 that, um, that Charlene spoke about, which is pioneering work in and of itself. And I'm very proud of the work that Trinidad and Tobago has been doing around that issue. And I remember the very early days when we were trying to get that off the ground. And thank you, Charlene, for your contribution in that regard. So that when I defined its role and our strategy for securing a space in the leadership of the regional team, and we were purposeful in all that we did, recognizing that really we're operating in this militarist space, a space that has been designed in that way to uphold the patriarchal tenets and norms and maintain power and control over, as Rebecca pointed us to in her presentation. But it really is a space that we are committed to challenging gender norms in. And so we'll continue to do the work that we do as members of international organizations, because we're also members of ICANN, um, and also to pilot pioneering work through CDRAV within our region and globally. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. I think there were um, great insights and um, into uh, how activism works and how um, the arms trade treaty is also very important, how small arms and light weapons um, also play a very crucial role, not only weapons of mass destruction, and um, we will now come to the Q&A. And I think we have very um, interesting questions in the chat that we would like to um, pose to our great panelists. Um, we would like to start with uh, Charlene. You spoke about um, your male counterparts and about um, hard security. And um, we have one question in the chat that reads, um, how can men in the field contribute more strongly as allies for women in forwarding a feminist discourse in security and disarmament? Um, so we're really interested to hear um, your insights on that as well. Sorry, thank you, Yanis. Um, I think it's important, first of all, for men, people, to understand that disarmament is most. Um, the stigma that's attached to uh, disarmament and international security, where you, you kind of have this idea of, as I said, men in suits, I can speak from that perspective as a diplomat representing my country in the first committee, um, being one of the very few female um, representatives, delegates in the first committee, um, and being just going into that committee in fall October after the high level week always felt like a very intimidating experience just to be very honest and I feel like there has to be and there, and there has been a mental shift again because of all the advocacy and all the work being done in the area of women and disarmament I think there has to be a realization that disarmament is about people there is also a humanitarian perspective when it comes to disarmament. And the idea that women are victims and we must always be seen as passive players, um, that has to be um, demystified. In fact, women are actually, um, we bring a lot more to the table, a lot to the table. 
um, different ideas, different perspectives. Um, and as 65, 69 advocates, women should be seen as instrumental actors, as empowered agents of change. I think first and foremost, as I said, there needs to be that mental shift. Um, and then, um, you know, that would help in a great way to kind of um, make it equitable for women in the area of disarmament and non-proliferation and arms control. Great, thanks, thanks Charlene. Um, I'm going to swiftly move on to the next question. I think it's an interesting question that came up in the chat um, asking for insight about trans participation perspectives, so taking um, gender beyond woman and man and in these intersect intersectional feminist spaces. Ray, I know you spoke about this in your presentation. Could you provide any further insight into this question from the chat? Sure. Um, yeah, I think queer perspectives have a lot to bring to the table in these conversations. Um, and I do include that also in, in the book. Um, and when I'm talking about the sort of feminist intersectional approach um, and process in terms of um, confronting power and um, deconstructing narratives. This is also a part of that of that process. Um, the the sort of resistance to or willingness to um, confront what is considered normative is um, extremely important to any of the processes that we're engaged in that I believe a queer perspective can bring unique um, understandings and reflections to. Um, ideas about how we can organize ourselves and build community is extremely important as well. Um, within the process to ban nuclear weapons, we really did spend years building up community of activists and diplomats and academics to take on the structures of dominance and the militarist organization of international relations, exactly what Charlene was just talking about, confronting those rooms full of men in suits um, can be intimidating. But when you build a community of people who are willing to take that on and not accept um, the structures that we're told are, this is the way things work. This is the way the world is supposed to work. This is the way our relationships are supposed to work. All of that can um, be really empowering and emboldening and really help us to, um, to queer the process and to uh, queer the way that we see the world and the way that we see each other and our ability to engage in that. For anybody that's more interested in the subject, I'm going to post in the chat a link to a really great uh, radio interview um, done in Melbourne, Australia with three um, queer activists that have been involved in anti-nuclear organizing there. And also um, ICANN has a queer branch or arm or whatever you want to call it, called International um, Queers Against Nukes, which is ICWAN instead of ICANN. So you can follow us on Twitter and we try and promote these types of perspectives and resources there as well. That's No Nukes Queers on Twitter. Thank you, Ray. I'm really looking forward to, to listening to the radio interview as well. Um, and um, next question um, is for, for Lade. Um, you spoke about um, patriarchal structures uh, a little bit in the end and then how um, that is, is hindering you um, to support women's integration and the integration of feminist perspectives. Um, we really like to, to you to um, gives you some space to elaborate more on that. How um, did you feel about the patriarchal structures when pushing for the, the ATT um, in the Caribbean um, and globally and um, yeah, how, how you felt about that and how you um, develop strategies to, to deal with that. Thank you very much for the question. And I think I want to take the opportunity to link that question with a question that I saw coming up about how do we uh, work with men as allies? Um, we were, we approached 
the work that we were doing, as I said, it, it, it was purposeful, very, very intentional, which is why we had to develop a strategy, really a stakeholder management strategy, because we know that it is not just a question of us managing the relationship with the big powerful countries that produce the weapons and so on, and, and, and who are opposed to having any kind of standards applied or, 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 um, or control of, of, of the operations, but that we also had to manage the regional tensions in two ways. One is the regional tension that you have between governments and NGOs. And like any other region, you have tensions between states and civil society. It happens in the Caribbean as well. Um, but also manage the relationship that you have with men who are accustomed to having power over. So that they have power over um, their, their staff, um, their, their portfolios, the particular um, environment that they're operating in. Charlene spoke about the, 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 the energy in the first committee. So we are working with men who are in a security environment and security for most people, particularly men, has to do with, with brawn and power over and, 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 and violence. Um, and we are a women's organization entering that space. And so we learned from our work in Trinidad and Tobago that as a women's organization entering the security space, you are coming into contact with men who immediately feel put upon. And because we are concerned and committed to, of course, ensuring women's leadership in every and, and, and any issue, but also saving lives. Because we are seeing the impact and we know that the, the gender analysis of the gun violence in the region has not occurred. That our governments have been responding to the perpetrators and the victims of the violence who are largely men. So that for us, there was a specific strategy around how do you manage men in a patriarchal militarist environment as a women's organization. So we did a lot of work in that area. And that's why I want to link it to the question around how do we get men as allies? And my question to that question is, what men are you talking about? Because we have men with varying experiences men with varying levels of power. Um, and so as we talk about building allies, we have to start um, determining who are the men we are talking to and who are the men that we are seeking to win over as allies and what would that look like? Because it is going to differ and therefore our messaging and our strategies have got to take that into account and be different. And I hope that that, that helps. Thank you, Fulade. Yes, and it's so important thinking about, as you and Charlene have spoken about today, about you know hard policy and soft policy and kind of the, the stereotypes associating women with entering soft policy and, and security issues and not as much in the hard um, defense and security issues. So I think, yeah, it's, um, it's a challenge to over, overcome these deep rooted norms and stereotypes. So thank you for your contribution. We have one, uh, another question from the chat that hopefully Rebecca, you may be able to provide some insights. Um, what do you think are concrete measures that can be taken to detach the discourse about international security and peace from the more intrinsically 
patriarchal narrative of power and military, military strength. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think that as a feminist humanitarian treaty that followed on both from the the generations of feminists from the you know the, the women working for the vote to you know Rosa Parks refusing to to um, move to the back of the bus in the civil rights movement to Greenham Common that I talked a little bit about right up to to now but also uh, drawing from the increasing humanitarian connections that were drawn first most explicitly uh, when uh, the coalition came together to ban landmines, then, then developed further for the cluster munitions, and then developed further in, um, in our um, strategies to ban nuclear weapons. And those, those, those two strands really show uh, where some of those answers are, because I've worked both as an activist, uh, an activist on the ground, but also as an analyst who could you know, swap with the, you know, with with any of the military, industrial, bureaucratic, academic discourses. Uh, indeed, did for 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 many years of my uh, career in various different kinds of of ways on deterrence and and on power. No, I know how nuclear weapons work because I also uh, have done work on verification, and you need to know those things. But but who deliberately you know, kept trying to emphasize that those theories trap all of us. And I think Ray really described this very, very clearly, trapped all of us into the territory of the objectives and the, the military industrial patriarchal colonialist um, object, uh, objectives um, that, um, uh, sorry, I just got put off because something something cropped up on my my pay uh, on, in front of me. Yeah, um, and they're very comfortable. You know, the the, the non proliferation treaty uh, framework. All of these are very very comfortable with power carrying on in the hands of the nuclear armed states and uh, who then manage the process supposedly of of of, of arms control of reductions. And what the both the feminist and the humanitarian um, approaches did was cut right through that and demand that, it, you know, the problem with these weapons are that they exist. The problem with these weapons are that they are part of a, a, a mechanism of power that uh, uses force and projection of force and others you know, creates situations in which instead of being all of humanity, recognizing that we're all together and we sink or swim together, and we certainly should be recognizing that with COVID and, um, and climate destruction, kept forcing us back into their narrative about, you know, nation states in, in perpetual conflict. And of course, if you create that narrative, that's what you'll get, you're gonna get. If you weaponize for that narrative, that's what you're gonna carry on getting. And so that's why it's so important that women get, you know, get involved and actually say, no, security isn't that. Security, and that's why I brought that in, security is about what makes us safe. And that is, you know, health, education. Um, it's about, you know, the services, uh, about resources going into a range of conflict, um, uh, you know, prevention, if you like. It's a whole different way of looking at conflict, not the conflict, as I said earlier, is not the problem. It is the use of weapons and the violence used to further the conflict uh, that then snaps it back into territory, very familiar and very powerful for those with the, the biggest arsenals and the patriarchal, most of, of whom are men. But let us not forget, we can have patriarchal leaders for all kinds of reasons, like you know, Margaret Thatcher was very, very um, um, uh, militaristic, precisely because that was the only way in which she could gain political power. Now, what we're trying to say as feminist disarmers is we need a lot more women, we need a lot more people with different 
uh, analyses, and I agree with with Ray's and, um, response on on the, the question. I, you know, I'm behind that banner on that very wet demonstration of women's march for to ban nuclear weapons. The, the, the day before the negotiations restarted at the UN on the TPNW. You know, we intersect in many different ways, but we have to bring our experience and we've got to actually analyze. Let's always remember patriarchy has a lot of different tools and weapons that they can use to silence and intimidate those that resist. In a lot of countries and places, primary among those that resist are women. And therefore, when we are silenced and intimidated, militarism wins. And we have to recognize that in order to really challenge that, we have to speak up, but we've got to speak up and build alliances with those that share the politics of um, nonviolence and of um, shared power. It isn't either or, it's both. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, really interesting, especially um, to give some some picture on um, the connections of activism and and uh, more uh, uh, theoretical thinking. Um, I think to um, wrap this whole discussion up, and I think we had a really um, interesting and insightful presentations and discussion. Um, we would like to um, post uh, a question to all of you um, and uh, to um, look forward a little bit to um, ask ourselves which are the next steps for feminist leadership in, in disarmament. Um, and we would like to do that, um, or we would like you to do that um, within one minute. Um, and uh, we would like to start in the opposite direction of um, how we started the talks. So we would like to start with uh, Folade, um, then uh, Charlene, Ray, and Rebecca. So the question is, um, which are the next steps for feminist leadership in disarmament um, looking forward? Yeah. Um, I, and thank you very much uh, for the question. And also as we wrap up, thank you very much for the opportunity to be on this panel and, um, and thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, in terms of next step, I think that there is need really for a very bold push to privilege the feminist perspective. I think it's important for us to count the numbers of women that we have who are representing either governments or civil society in the work around non-proliferation, arms control, disarmament, and so on and so forth. But I think unless we are purposeful in terms of what the message and our intent is, we can allow ourselves to fall into a false sense of security that with the increasing numbers, our agenda is being advanced. And so I think that we must not retreat. Those of us who are clear about what needs to happen, we must not retreat in terms of advancing that position um, and not allow ourselves as well to get caught in the narrative around women's leadership is a softer approach. We we have to de we 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 have to um, to ensure that when we talk about women's leadership, that we present it for what it is. If, as Rebecca said, we're talking about what we, how we should be talking about seeking and addressing security in that alternative way of looking at human security and recognizing the relationship between human security and the weapons that we are seeking to disarm or to prevent from, from, from circulating, then it gives us the authority and the confidence to advance our agenda. And I want to say it is really important for us to be very firm in advancing our agenda 
it's a feminist perspective and it is the way to change the world. And I want to, to, um, to affirm all the women on this panel for all that you're doing to advance that agenda and say thank you. Thank you. For that, we would like to echo that, um, of course, to advance that agenda. And um, yes, the, the same question, which are the next steps for feminist leadership in disarmament um, for Charlene for one minute. Thank you, Yanis. I would totally, I agree exactly with what, um, with what Falade said, um, and not allowing ourselves to be caught up in, in a narrative. Um, there's been so much progress um, as it relates to um, women in disarmament over the past few years, but I, I would always um, try to see things or, or see things from, from a state perspective. Um, and I think that while discussions like this um, are amazing and they've been ongoing and help in such a great way, um, it comes back to the decisions that are made in the conference rooms, the discussions that takes place in, in the conference rooms. Um, and at the end of the day, it really comes down to practical measures and initiatives um, that government working with civil society um, always have been an advocate of civil society, um, working together to advance um, the role of women in disarmament. Um, so I would say that um, conversations are good, it's well and fine, but at the end of the day, there needs to be practical interventions, um, practical measures, um, in order to advance this objective and to take it forward and to keep it moving. Thanks. Thank you, Shaleen. Um, really important as well to strengthen the um, practical measures. Um, same question as well to um, Ray now. What are the next steps for feminist leadership and disarmament from your perspective and one minute for you? So I agree, of course, with what Flade and, and Charlene have um, have said and just building on that. I think for me, one thing I'm quite keen to do is to move from um, to build on the progress that Charlene says that we have made in terms of awareness about the importance of women's participation and disarmament and to really broaden that out beyond just the binary and to frame it in a broader context of diversity so that we're not just talking about women, but we're talking about people with a variety of um, perspectives and experiences to bring into the conversation, diversity in terms of all genders, as well as race and ethnicity and region, et cetera. Um, and to really focus our work, um, be it the discussions or the practical initiatives or whatever it is that we're doing, really focus on the, on the diversity of perspectives that we're bringing into the room and that we are building community to maintain the line of challenge and resistance in order to reconstitute what is considered credible. Because this is really one of the main challenges that we face inside the conference rooms that Charlene has, has discussed. And, you know, Rebecca mentioned Margaret Thatcher, we can bring up other um, women leaders over time who have, um, you know, they become uh, in, in encapsulated themselves within the militarist system that they're working within in order to maintain power and be considered credible and rational. So what we actually want to do is not just be participants in the system, but change the system itself um, and where we need to, to build new systems and structures in order to do that as well. Thank you, Ray, for um, yeah, applying the intersectional angle to change the system, really. Um, and I think, um, yeah, the last um, one is Rebecca. Um, and uh, Rebecca, for you as well, um, the question, which are the next steps for feminist leadership in disarmament um, in one minute? Okay, thank you. C can I start by saying, I think I feel, I just feel it's such a privilege to be sharing um, this, this panel with such wonderful, strong feminist 
uh, leaders in, in, in disarmament and security, you know, from a number of different countries. And I really agree with every point that you've made. So let me just add a, a different one in that I think often gets missed. And that is, we have really got to recognize that in order for any of our movements or our work to really go forward in whatever area we work, we have to be tackling violence uh, physical, sexual, and psychological violence used against women and girls. We have them in all of our organizations, whether, you know, the UN peacekeepers, the, the NGOs that work on, on peace and disarmament, you know, sometimes claiming to be feminist, the obviously in politics, the, these are abuses of power but they have an absolutely pernicious impact on other objectives that we have, which is to bring more women into working in all of these areas of work and in, in, in developing their own strengths and skills. So uh, I would say recognize that too many of our organizations when faced with incidences or you know, complaints of, of violence against women, will either try to shut them down or try to, to, to wrap them up somewhere for the sake of the credibility of carrying on in that particular organization. We've seen this, you know, from the top to bottom of politics and civil society. We must not do that because when we do that, we signal that, you know, the, the, the direct violence against, you know, individual women is not taken seriously by us. And how can we be talking about eliminating the violence from weapons wielded by power abusers um, if we are not uh, really uh, taking on these issues in tandem with each other and creating a space that is inviting and safe and, and, and possible for women to enter into this, this, this connects with, I think, all of the things that the other speakers have said, but um, I think it needs to be said, said really directly, uh, because it is violence against women that maintains the structures and tactics of the military industrial extractivist profiteering institutions that bring us the weapons and the, you, you know, and the controls that we then are trying to undo. Thank you, Rebecca. I totally agree. You've brought everything together that has been spoken about very nicely. And thank you again for further inspirational advice for, for women to enter and progress in the field. Thank you. Unfortunately, we are going to have to end this discussion now. Um, it seems a shame because I feel that there's so much more to speak about. But just a reminder that this is the opening webinar to our webinar series. We will be having these important discussions every two weeks on Wednesdays at two o'clock um, UK time. Our next webinar in two weeks time is on the 3rd of March, the Nuclear Ban Treaty, a game changer for female participation. You can find information on Scrap's website, on our social media. So please keep, um, keep an eye out for all that's going on. Thank you um, to everyone that has come today. I hope you have also found it very interesting, thought provoking, um, especially a huge thank you to our incredible five speakers as well, Christine Ann, um, we can't forget who is not here, but we will um, certainly be in contact with her. Thank you, Rebecca Johnson, Ray Atchison, Charlie, Charlene Rupnari, Folade Mutauta and Christine Ann, thank you.